travel and things in association with Ragged Wear, Real People, Real Clothing, Real Solutions presents In Conversation With. I am your host, David Batsoffen, and joining me today, the author of a brand new book, It Takes a Tsunami, and that's Rail Levitt. Rail, good day, welcome to you. Yes, thank you. Good morning to you too. It Takes a Tsunami. Um, but in your instance, it was your own induced tsunami. I mean, you re you write a tell-all book about yourself. I mean, with no punches pulled. <laughs> yeah, there's no there's no there's no punches pulled. But I mean, I I do write about two tsunamis, in fact, yes. and the second one, I suppose, I, I certainly do take uh, responsibility for. Um, although there was a configuration of different events, like all. Oh, of the bad things that happened to us the first tsunami i can't take any credit for um it was the real tsunami uh in thailand in 2004 um and while i can take responsibility for my actions um i think the teutonic plates shifting wasn't really of my doing but yes the second tsunami um was of uh yeah, i played a material role in this so let's look at, at the first one first what was it like to be there at the time and actually physically experience a tsunami yeah i mean what you know i was i was reading a quite an interesting book the other day um called the psychology of money which is a great book highly recommended and uh he talks about in the book the author talks about surprises and you know life is full of surprises and the, and the thing that probably surprises us most is that we think there won't be surprises so surprises are, are events and sometimes they're good and bad but but the real tsunami was such a a bolt out of the blue, as was the sort of subsequent tsunami, which I'm sure right. talk about. it was completely unexpected. So I, I was uh, in Thailand, which I've gone to regularly with a group of very close friends. And being in that tsunami, it was like one minute we were sitting, or I was actually in fact running on the on the beautiful white sands of the pit. Um, and then moments later, this modern history's greatest uh, natural disaster happened. And I think in the, in the moment of that sort of panic of, of the of the natural disaster, the only thought was survival, you know? mm -hmm. and then later came the sort of thoughts of what it meant and, and what it like it felt like to be there. But it, pretty much to answer the question, what did it feel like at the moment? It felt completely surreal, as as if you were sort of like an out of body experience and you're watching a movie of somebody else's movie. Did all your friends survive? No, in fact, so I, um, we were quite a large group, and I, I on that particular morning, it was Boxing Day 2004, I had gone running with um, a chap from Cape Town who I knew very well. We had been there many times together, and him and his girlfriend, it was actually the three of us, we were running on the on the beach quite early in the morning. Um, it just so happened that while we were running, there was this earth tremor, um, which was the actual tsunami in, in, in nearby Sumatra, Indonesia. So... Uh, as we got back to our hotel, which is on, on the beachfront in Phuket, um, and uh, we separated. And you know, you know the sort of the closing sliding doors. Like he went mm. right. He, in fact, actually asked me to come to this little supermarket. He was a bit of a health fanatic. Um, and he asked me to come to the supermarket to get some fruit. I was, I like a big breakfast. So I was like heading towards the, the, my other mates at the breakfast buffet. And I never saw him alive again. Yeah. It was literally 20 minutes. This, the, the sea slammed into the beach front and he was below ground, a couple of steps below ground. And, and unfortunately, him and his girlfriend passed away um, in that tsunami. Um, the rest of us survived and okay. yeah, I could tell the tale. And it's one of those tales that, in retrospect, I suppose, as the years pass, it, it, it fades just a little bit. Then every now and again, um, yeah. it's brought to the fore. Like with, I suppose, the reason for your book. Um, which is here, it takes a tsunami. Yeah. Um, it's I'll published find myself by Mercury. As well. but, yeah, I see. It's published by Mercury, yeah. which is uh, part of burnettmedia.co.za. Um, and of course, people, I well, not of course, I think people remember this incident uh, rail that seemed to derail, and I don't mean to use that as a pun, your entire yeah. business career. One yeah. slip of slip of the tongue, slip of the wrist, missed hitting of the hammer, because Auction Alliance was one of the biggest auction houses in South Africa at the time, before this particular event took place. So talk us through 
your history in, in auctioneering. Why auctioneering? What sort of a job is this for a nice Jewish boy? Come on now. Well, okay. So, David, I mean, you sound just like my late father because he, he certainly did ask that question. Um, exactly as you put it. He obviously read the book because he, I make reference to that because it's uh, <laughs> not a business for nice Jewish boys. So, how, how I got into auctioneering um, was an interesting story on its own. So, my, my, my late father um, and my mom is still alive. They, they, we, they lived in Belleville, which is a place most people who live on the Dante Sea would have heard of, but it's quite far away. On the other side of the Burwas borderline. And um my dad was running a practice. I I went, I was at school and I used to help my mom selling selling homes. She did it as a part-time estate agent. And I literally started selling homes uh, while I was still 17. Um, I used to accompany her to meetings and then I started selling on my own. And um in the in, in the in the book gives interesting context in South Africa, uh, historic context, because you know, we, we live in a, in a greater macro environment. And it just so happened that as I finished school, the new South Africa happens. Like literally, I was, our last year was school, FW de Kerk gets appointed president and a year later he releases Nelson Mandela. So you're in that context of that environment. And it was still this thing called the Group Areas Act, where, which was a sort of racist town planning. And um, I sort of chose the, the, the in those days, the, the, the so-called colored and, and, F and black areas largely because they were no one was working in them. I just saw a gap. Um, and the traditional estate agencies wanted to sell homes in Claremont and Seapoint. And so, so I started selling homes there. And then uh, there were so many repossessions by, by, 90, by the sort of early 90s, um, largely because interest rates had gone up to close to 25%, or like more than double what they are today. And that caused a, thousands of homes to be repossessed. And while I was busy selling these homes, um, and literally was selling it while before I was I was going to UCT to study law, which I subsequently did. Um, on the school holidays, the, the banks used to send out all lists of the repossessions in a, in a, in a thing called a fax machine, which I don't know if you actually remember. <laughs> the fax used to arrive and they used to have these lists of reams and reams. And one of the banks, which was a bank called the Permanent Building Society, came up with a scheme and they said, look, we've got so many thousands of that you literally buy a sign today. You don't even have to put on a deposit. You, you, in three years' time, you can buy the property. And so I bought my first property at the tender age of, of 18, um, largely because I, I didn't even need to use my bonnets for money uh, to put on the deposit. <laughs> and while I was in uh, renovating this home of the school, of the, of the university holidays, I then subsequently enrolled at UCT because there was no options in those days. It was either the army or study. So uh, while I was at UCT, um, a chap comes past uh, this home that I was standing on the outside of the home. Was he helping the builders fix it up? And when we're in a home, I'm talking about a real sort of small property on the Cape Flats, uh, an area called Blue Downs, and this happened to be the sheriff of the court. And he asked me for directions in those days. There was no GPS. There was not even map books in those areas, but I knew the areas. And I took him to the uh, the property where, where I saw my first auction. And I then started attending auctions while I was at UCT. So I'd literally, in the morning, I would traipsed up to UCT and learned Latin and Roman Dutch law and all various other things. And then by, I would always, by midday, I would jump in my car. And those days, you had to wear a suit because um, <laughs> no one would. And I used to go to all the, all the sheriff's auctions, what they call sales and execution. And um, it just so happened that one day, and I, I befriended the sheriff of the court at that time in Belleville. And he said to me, okay, listen, today's your lucky day because the, there was a bank there. They didn't want a lot, a lot for the property. And I bought my first home for, for 30, a second home, because I bought one before. I, I bought a home for 30,000 Rand. And I immediately, because I was selling, I immediately sold it, sell, I sold it. So for a period of, um, until my 21st birthday, I would buy and sell homes. Um, yeah. so, Again, and, in, um, in interesting, interesting pathway, because you're doing law on the one hand, and then flipping homes on the other. And and what, you talk of sheriff's auctions, um, Rail, wasn't yeah. anything like, there was a, an American TV show, the name of which escapes me right now, but it was a group of guys, and they're always the same men and women that go out to buy yeah. homes, and they bid, yeah. and they fight with each other, and and then they're not allowed to see inside the home, and then when they do open the doors, it's either trashed and they've wasted their money, yeah. or it's stunning yeah. and beautiful, and they've made a fortune. I then subsequently went to look at some of those people online and discovered that yeah. half of them ended up in jail. For fraud and money laundering and all sorts of interesting <laughs> stuff. 
Well, I, I, I can't say it was pretty much like that. I don't think anyone of the ten of those auctions have ended up in jail, although maybe a couple got close. But um, <laughs> the, the, it, it, it was like that, um, but with one material difference. In, in that period, I would like rock up at an auction sale. Um, as in, now I was an attendee. I wasn't. I hadn't thought of doing auctions at that point. Um, and there wasn't. It was myself. It was the sheriff who was the auctioneer, and it was the representative of the bank. And I literally would be the three of us. And it wasn't even really an auction. And so the bank, the bank, guy from the bank said, listen, you know, we need uh, 40,000 Rand for this house. I would say, yes. The sheriff would start auctioning. He said, ladies and gentlemen, any bids here? There was like two of us. I'd say, 40. <laughs> so I, bought, I was buying these properties and I, and I was flipping them. And then sort of by the time I reached my 21st birthday, my, my father was not, my father was a real sort of small town lawyer. Um, and he was, a, I was the youngest kid. I think he was a bit oblivious to what I was doing. Um, and uh, I bought like 20 homes in a, in a period of about a year and a half. And then all of a sudden I realized my first good business lesson that cash flow is the life of business. Mm. And I, I'd run out of money because I'd been putting down these deposits and flipping these homes and sort of juggling it. And I got into, I, I got into actually a little bit of a panic because I bought all these homes. And I knew I could sell them and I had no idea how to raise money and, I went to the, the then United Building Society. They said to me, look, they'll give me a bond. Um, those days was all very different. Um, they would give me a bond, but um, I needed cash. And so the one day I was thinking, how can I get quick cash? So I thought, well, hold on a second. I'm going to all these auctions. They're poorly attended. No one knows about them. They are done on the courthouse steps. And I'd learned in that period that there was a there was actually a, a rule in the in the magistrate's court act which allowed external auctioneers. And I just decided I'm going to be an auctioneer because I needed quick cash to pay for the homes that I bought. In fact, it was it, it was more a means to an end than, than the end itself. And so I said, I'm going to be an auctioneer. And I was all of 21. I, I then enrolled. I finished sort of undergraduate UCT. I was in my first year, in my LLB at UCT, first few months. And I, I had met a lot of these bankers as I was going around to buy homes. And one of the banks had just formed, um, that's a bank, which was a bank called the Amalgamated Banks of South Africa. It was an amalgamation of four banks, which is APSA. Of course, and APSA had just formed, and they had real cuck on their hands because APSA <laughs> had all these other allied, trust bank and podcasts, and the repossessions were enormous. And they had sent a chap down from Johannesburg, and I had met him at one of these auctions. He was the big, the big boss. And in fact, that's how the book starts, is me having this first meeting at the age of 21 and I meet this chap um, who was the then regional head. And I convinced him to give me some auctions. I want to stop you there, Rail, um, because you've yes. mentioned becoming an auctioneer. So two questions. Yes. Is there a school for auctioneers? And does the pattern of a house selling auctioneer different from that of the tobacco and cattle type auctioneers specifically in the States, who, who can speak so fast that us regular humans cannot decipher a word they say. And is that part of the whole deal? So that you have no idea what's going on until somebody points a finger at you and goes, sold to number 265. And you go, what the, have I just bought? Yes. So to, to answer the question, the, in South Africa, I don't know if it is today, there was, like, they called it the School of Auctioneering. There was a couple of courses on auctions. In fact, I, I did enroll in one of them, but they never taught us that chant is what you're referring mm -hmm. to. So the, the story about the, the auction chant, it does differ from product to product, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So um, the Americans and the Australians, who were a little bit more sing-song generally when they talk, they had that like that rattle fire of, of, of auctions. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to an auction in in Sotheby's in London, for example, or you go to a property auction in London, it will be much more sort of urbane and more sort of measured. Um, in South Africa, we actually had adopted the, a mixture of the two. So, so they do actually chant here. Now, if, if you go to a cattle auction here in cattle auction in, in South Africa, um, look, a lot of these things have gone online today. But if you go to a cattle auction, um, the traditional one, you you will hear a lot of it in Afrikaans. You know, that sort of real and like as, as a so, so I, I what I did was that chant creates a lure and I, I learned probably later um what the reason why they do that chant and the reason why they do it it, it is quite melodic and mesmerizing the the tobacco auctioneers in Zimbabwe 
actually do it in like a song, in a form mm. of a song. Like, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, if you remember, they used to be that old assault gunston. I don't know if you remember yep. that, used to be that. So, so, so in South Africa, um, I did use that chant in uh, property auctions. The, the sheriffs didn't. They were very like staccato. It's like, oh, I've got one. And there was that chant. And, um, but I, I couldn't learn how to do it. And it, you're talking about a world now with no YouTube, no, no yeah. nothing. You were no tutorials for you to study. No I tutorials. An auction chart. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you could go to like the, the, the library and so what, what I did, I, I attended a few auctions and I taught myself actually. So mm. I never went to school how to auction. And I used to go into the into the shower and I used to count the tiles and I was like, at one tile, two tile, three tile, four, five, <laughs> six tile, seven tile, eight. And to learn that chant. And I mean, mm. that chant creates that sort of auction environment and, and yeah. atmosphere. Now, going back to, to Auction Alliance, I mean, you guys yes. were front and center. You were at all the big auctions were done by you. The radio radio loved you. TV loved you. Um, you were on and off being interviewed by a variety of programs. And then I suppose the whole mission of this book, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, devolves down to one auction that seems to have gone wrong for all the wrong reasons. And you yes. were tackled by somebody who has the money, the time, and the influence to take you on. And she did for the longest time, just relentless. So let's go back to, is it pronounced coin? The coin, the yes. Point. yes. It's yeah. not Q-U-I-N, but pronounced coin. Okay. It's like Chol Mondele in, in the Durrell series, and his name was Chumley. Um, That's right. So what went wrong there? And why, and I suppose we can mention her by name because she's in the book and the it's in the public domain. Now, why did Wendy Applebaum take such offense to what seems to have been a practice that was done by all auctions? Yet she seemed specifically to tackle you on this one. Did she want that property so badly? Well, I mean, the, the, I'll explain in a moment. I think just the, the little bit between the the... the... The auction alliance growing. In fact, uh, I just wanted to make reference that the auction alliance was a, an overnight success story that took 20 years. So by the time I started that first auction, which I mentioned, to the day I arrived at Quinn Rock, it was literally I'd started in uh, 19 started in 1992, and this was at the end of 2011. The Quinn Rock auction was in December the 10th. So I was a highly experienced auctioneer at this point, and it is true. That auction alliance at that point represented 60% of the entire South African auction market. I mean, we were six out of every 10 auctions in, in number, in, in value even more than that, because we, we did all the big ones. In fact, that very year of Quinrock, we, we had auctioned, we had sold a couple of properties for, for the sale was like, uh, uh, yeah, it was 400 million rand on one auction. It was the biggest auction that it ever did. So we had really revolutionized and changed the auction industry. And I fully understood that business. More so, it wasn't a case that, like, every now and again, you know, there, there were articles um, and said, you know, Levitt's a crook and this happened at an auction and there was, was nothing. I was the golden boy of auctions, the golden boy in terms of uh, public perception, in terms of media, um, and I had a, a very good reputation. So coming back to, um, to, to the Coin Rock auction, I mean, the background itself what was particularly interesting because it belonged to this chap called Dave King and had been seized by the South African Revenue Services. And they, they were my client. Now, if, if to fast forward and to answer your question, why, why did it turn out into the, this sort of massive battle is largely because uh, Wendy Applebaum herself is, is not a person who suffers fools gladly. Um, she's, um, after that auction, she developed a reputation as being a, a sort of social justice fighter in, in many ways. It was her first sort of public spat. So I think the first thing that annoyed her, uh, well, let me get straight to the point, is when, when she asked me who was bidding against her, although it was common practice, my first initially my staff and then I, we lied to her. So we never told her that it was what what they call a vendor bidder. Right. Um, we just said it. And um, the, uh, so, so, so she took huge umbrage to that and, and, and for good reason. Now, there were one or two other things that had happened. Even on the day of the auction, I hadn't, in fact, um, she, she made mentions many times. She said she smelt a rat. In fact, there was the first article which appeared was, Bidder who smells a rat. 
um, because as the auction concludes and it gets knocked down to her at, at 55 million rand, I don't go up to wish her muzzle to or congratulations. I, uh, I, I didn't do that. And the reason I didn't do that because I knew that the price was too low and that SARS were not going to be happy and weren't going to take the price. So she, she really took umbrage to that. And then I was dishonest with her. I never told her what, what, what had actually happened. So she uh, took huge umbrage to it. And, um, and I, probably the, the sort of the, the, the third thing which really got her going was, it was I, I was contacted. It was only actually, it was only two months after the sale in, in early January of 2012. Um, I get contacted by the Sunday Times. And I thought the Sunday Times sort of, when the journalist phoned me, he sort of said to me, I've spoken to Wendy Applebaum. So I thought that Wendy had gone to the media to say, listen, this Levitt's a crook um, and I'm not happy. But actually, that wasn't the case. And so I spoke to the media and I sort of poo-pooed what she said. I said, no, she's not talking, it's too low and she bit too low, et cetera, et cetera. So the, she said that I took her on in the media. And Wendy is, um, in fact, I've never met, most people don't know that, I, I actually have never met Wendy Applebaum. We've never, we've never actually met. Um, I saw at the auction that day, we had a telephone conversation for all of 30 seconds after the auction. But I understand she's a person who, like, if you take her on, she's going to show you, teach you a lesson. And so when she saw me talking in the media about this auction and I was sort of like downplaying it and saying that she was overreacting, et cetera, et cetera, that really got her, her up, going up. And then I think the social justice, um, I want to say warrior, because that sounds, uh, I don't, I mean, I've tried not you, to be you critical. Woke, you woke something just, within her that wanted to well, take it. Uh, she, she's she's got very strong views. So she yeah. says, okay, you know, this auction industry is just a bunch of crooks. And I, Wendy Applebaum, I am going to clean it up. And, you know, she tried to do that in a few other things at that, you know, after she sort of her public profile changed. She said, I am going to clean it up. And it became now, and, with, and you know, Wendy spoke in Forbes magazine and she says, like, you know, I am like a dog with a bone. It's like I, I've got dog of determination. And so with that, it just... I mean, and it was a series of events that just went, and, and I acted poorly by 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 being dishonest with her. Is, Initially, I did a few really poor things in terms of how I dealt with the media, and so would, it just you had done things enough. differently, Rail. Looking back now, and and I think you mentioned it in in the book. Um, would you have have gone to her early on and said, "Listen, I made a mistake, screwed up. This is how the auction actually went down." Can we shake hands and move on? Or can we try and resolve the issue by getting you a better price or getting SARS to agree to the 55 million? I know they were looking for 75 at the time. Yeah, I mean, David, I mean, I can just say, I was a fucking idiot. I mean, the, the um, you know, like sometimes you look back in your life and you're like, why did I even do that? Um, yeah. Sometimes we do that immediately. Sometimes we, we go look back at our lives and we go like, you know, for years we thought, think we're right. But, uh, it was literally one cup of, uh, I reckon, you know, as difficult as Wendy may be, and again, I've never met her, so I don't know, but I obviously know a lot of people who know her, I probably could have sorted it out over a cup of coffee. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's such a great lesson in life, because we often, we don't do that. I mean, I can, and, and even worse than that was that she actually invites me for a cup of coffee um, to settle it. So she, she, so about two, a week after the sale, uh, the, the liquidators had already said, and Sars said, there's no way we can accept her mm -hmm. price. Get this text message out of the blue. I mean, we're talking so long ago, there wasn't even a thing called WhatsApp around, um, believe it or not, 10, uh, 11 years ago. So she sends me this text message and says, look, let's get together before this thing gets really messy. And what I did was, it, because I knew the price wouldn't be confirmed, and also truth be told, it was the end of the year, and I was like, tired, and I wanted to go on holiday. So I basically sent her a message, which wasn't rude but probably came across as arrogant and i said to her listen you know i don't think it's necessary that we meet your price is too low and like let's leave it at that mm -hmm. and i mean of course you know i should have got in the car sat down the and i should have told her what happened and yeah. i literally think we resolved it there and then, but i didn't and um and you know sometimes like those one or two little moments in our life where we make poor decisions can really trigger a series of, of Sliding. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, it's sliding doors and it's tsunamis. Do you believe I, I, that she's read the book, Rail? And if so, how, how do you think she is going to, do you think she'll respond or do you think she's sitting and going, 
Yeah, the football, if only he'd taken that cup of coffee. None of he wouldn't have even had a book to write. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I truth be told is I'm I'm not sure if she's read, I don't know if she's read the book or not. I have um, recently, because some, you know, I have a, we have a common friend actually, and the co common friend said, "Listen, you know, this is probably like a great time uh, for you and Wendy to get together, and even actually, you know, it came up with quite a cute idea. He said, yeah, let's do like a charity event, and, mm -hmm. and you can. I remember, I've never done an auction after that Quinn Rock auction. I never stepped on the podium ever again. Mm -hmm. So he said, like, let's do. He said, are you open to that? So I said, I absolutely am. He chatted to Wendy. Um, he just sent me a WhatsApp and said, no, she's not open to that conversation. I don't know why. Um, yeah. He'll have a chat with me. It was about a week and a half ago. But I'm open to, um, to have it because actually it would be a nice ending to, to the story. It's yeah. like, um, what is the takeaway from people who have bought and who have bought your book and read it or who are about to buy it and read it? What do you want the takeaway to be for them? I think the real takeaway, and the, I mean, the book's got multiple themes and run through it, and if you've read it, you, you'll pick up the different themes, but I think the, 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 the ultimate core of the book is that we all go through some shocking moment in our lives, whether it's in our personal lives or whether it's COVID or, or, or whether whatever it is, and, and different people have different levels of what has happened. It's, it's amazing. Everyone will say, you know, at some part, I suffered a death, I suffered a trauma, I had a breakup, a divorce, I had an illness. So... But when that happens, um, ultimately, it takes a tsunami to know what you're made of. And that's where the book name comes from, to, to say, you know, we all go through those shocking moments. But what defines us as human beings is actually not that we go through those things and we make mistakes and we, uh, we mess up and we screw up. And, but the fact is, when those things happen to us, whether they were the tsunami in Thailand, which, you know, I, I didn't trigger it or the other one where you actually play a major role in it, at still the end of the day, we do find disastrous situations. And in fact, it is, it is at those moments when we dig deep and get to know ourselves and, and try and rise above it. That's the ultimate message. And, and it has resonated with many people. And it's certainly, you know, if I, if I look back and I go, that's the story that that's produced and it can teach a lesson to myself, which it has naturally, and it can teach a lesson to those around me and, and anyone can read it. I think it's the ultimate message. Great stuff, Rail. We're about out of time. The book... It takes a tsunami. It's by Rail Levitt. It's uh, printed by or published by Burnett Media. It's available at all bookstores currently, online. It is available, it is available at all the bookstores. It is available on Amazon and Takeout. And then recently, I did an audio book because we're living, and I didn't use the new AI. I have literally set up uh, the studio. <laughs> so the, it's, there is an audio book which is being released at the moment. It's coming through on all. Great stuff, Rail. Really. Thanks very much for chatting to me. I wish you all the Thank best you. going forward. And I do hope that you and Wendy eventually sit down, uh, have that cup of coffee, and that you can go going, going, gone. Rail Levitt was my guest today. We've been chatting about It Takes a Tsunami.